All right, I want to thank everybody for coming. This is our, uh, our mini symposium on simulation informatics, which over the next 25 minutes or so, David and I are going to tell you what that is exactly. Uh, first, I want to thank the SIAM, and I want to thank the organizers for, uh, one, for letting us give this mini symposium, putting together this really cool conference. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm Paul Constantine. I am a postdoc at, uh, at Stanford University. I was a 2009 von Neumann Fellow at Sandia National Labs, and before that I got my PhD in, in 2009 at, uh, at Stanford in the, the Institute for Computational Mathematical Engineering. My research interests are in uncertainty quantification, uh, and also model reduction and, and approximation theory and, and uh, numerical linear algebra and computational math, and, you know, buzzwords. Um, who doesn't like buzzwords? So, uh, so this is actually going to be a tag team talk. I'm going to give the first half, and then my co-organizer, David Leik, is going to give the second half. This is David. David was also my classmate at Stanford. Uh, we graduated at the same time, submitted our theses within an hour of each other, actually. And then we I were... first. <laughs> yeah, David was first by one hour. Uh, and then we were both... David was also the... Wave was a 2010 von Neumann Fellow at Sandia. So um, and, there. <laughs> and, and a lot of the work that we'll, that we'll talk about today is uh, sort of comes out of a project that, that got started at Sandia. Um, so this is going to be very much an overview talk. So there's not going to be a whole lot of technical information in my talk in particular. I'm really looking forward to the other talks in the, in the mini symposium, and I hope that you stick around for those because they're going to be much more technical in content than what I'm going to present. What I want to present is more of a philosophy, more of a motivation, more of how do we walk from uncertainty quantification, which is the, uh, you know, the, the motivation and theme behind this conference, to, to an informatics kind of perspective, or, or how does an informatics perspective inform how we might think about uncertainty quantification. So it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be more of an overview. So here's the whole, the whole talk in one slide, uh, in one sentence even, that our goal is to persuade you that it is both reasonable and pragmatic to consider uncertainty quantification from the point of view of analysis of a database of simulation outputs. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm just going to let that speak for itself and go ahead and move to the outline. So like I said, we'll start with a path going from UQ to this idea of simulation informatics, which will become clearer the more I talk about it. Uh, Dave will get up and start and talk about our project that we had at Sandia and sort of give the story and, and sort of the actual uh, background about the work that we proposed and the work that we done at Sandia and the work that continues forward. And then we'll have a few announcements and looking forward. So, so the idea is that this mini symposium is hopefully going to be thematically consistent. Um, I'm excited about all the talks and I'll give an introduction to the talk in the in, in, uh, introduction to each talk in the context of this theme of uh, informatics for database or simulations, simulation results. So UQ on certain quantification is a really big umbrella. This is a wordle that I put together from the uh, session titles for, for the entire conference. And you can see uncertainty quantification standing out really big, uh, at least in terms of the word count for session titles. Uh, methods, problems, models, systems, inverse, analysis, modeling, data, stochastic, simulation, sensitivity. There's, there's a whole lot that goes into uncertainty quantification. Um, the perspective that I'm going to talk about when I talk about walking from UQ to simulation informatics will be sort of the perspective that I've, that I've come from, which is um, the analysis of parameterized uh, partial differential equations. Uh, but it's a big umbrella, and, uh, and, and there are lots of things that fit in here that don't necessarily fit into what I start calling the general UQ setup. So let's say that I have a system of equations where U is my solution, and omega is going to rep represent some randomness. So R here is my differential operators and boundary conditions and forcing, or it's very abstract. Um, and then U is our solution. And then omega is some abstract component for now that's just going to represent randomness in the system. And that, re that randomness may, may, uh, may enter this system through boundary conditions, maybe through forcing terms, maybe through material properties. It's some kind of inputs to the model that we're typically thinking about. To be a little bit more concrete, the uh, the perspective that I'm coming, one of the problems that I work on sort of on a daily basis these days is, uh, is the Stanford PSAP Centers project. So the PSAP Center is the Predictive Science Academic Alliance Program, which is uh, an alliance between the DOE labs, or NNSA labs in particular, and, and universities. Stanford has one of these centers. Um, there's also Michigan and Caltech and Purdue and Texas. Um, and so, so the Stanford problem that they have for, that is the focus of their center is the prediction of a phenomenon called, called unstart in a hypersonic vehicle. 
So the question is, this is a this is a scramjet engine, the combustor of a scramjet engine, and it can uh, and there's all these shocks in there, and there's shock dynamics and thermal management, heat release, fuel injection, and each of these physical components, each has its own physical model, and then each of those physical models in turn has its own set of uncertainties, right? Some some kind of parameters that are that are maybe not described fully or that we model with with uh, with REN with, um, with REN variables. Um, and so then the types of questions that you might ask from a system like this are, what are the predicted quantities of interest? What is it that we're trying to predict with this model, given that there are uncertainties in each of these physical components? Uh, what are the sources of those uncertainties? And how do we model those uncertainties? In particular, a common step that is made in these kinds of problems is that we replace that abstract random component, or that abstract parameter omega representing randomness abstractly by some set of parameters which each have their own density functions. Uh, and so now we're, now we're in a position where we're much closer to computation because now we have a, give it a value for the input parameters, which you can think of as a realization of that stochasticity, um, then you have a PDE that you want to solve. And so then the general UQ setup is now, you can think of that PDE as implicitly defining a function of the parameters, right? So we have our solution U, <laughs> that is implicitly, implicit through the system of equations and being uh, a function of, the, of those input parameters. And so graphically, in terms of a cartoon, uh, you might have some kind of a, a, a density function on the set of inputs, and you do your forward uncertainty quantification, your forward propagation problem, and you end up with some kind of density on the outputs. And conversely, you might start with some kind of measurement data, or a density function on the outputs, and you might want to know, well, what was the density function on the inputs that gave that is consistent with that measured data that, I've, uh, data that I have measured? <clears throat> and so, when you think about things as just a function of the parameters, then this brings in this non-intrusive paradigm. So, if you've been to many of the talks, you've heard of things being non-intrusive or intrusive about whether we want to just use our PDE solver, given the input parameters, can we just use that solver and its outputs to, uh, to, to do our UQ problem. So we, we think of our simulation code as an input-output map or some kind of a black box. Well, given the inputs, we compute our solution to the outputs. And so then, rephrasing this, the forward problem is that we'll sample from the inputs. You know, this is now we're doing this computationally. We sample from the inputs, we draw samples from the density function of our inputs, and then for each of those samples, we'll run the code to generate samples for the outputs, and then we have some statistical characterization from those samples. And the inverse problem may be stated as, we search through that input space to find the outputs, uh, or, or maybe some statistical characterization, um, that match the given measurements. Yeah. So, uh, so if we have some, some measurements, then we'll, we'll twiddle the inputs, basically, to somehow get our outputs close to given measurements. And for example, this could be like Sandia's Dakota framework. How many of you guys are familiar with Dakota? So Brian Adams is like the code, the guy who owns the code of Dakota, so, so I'm glad you raised your hand. That's, that's important. Um, but what happens if, so that, so that all that is fine and dandy if, you, if your code is really easy to evaluate. You wrap Dakota around it, you run it as many times as you need to. But what if your code is like that picture I showed, some kind of multi-physics, high fidelity simulation code with all kinds of components. It's complicated, it takes a long time to run a computer. So if my code is too expensive. What you can do is construct some kind of a surrogate for your computer code. And many, 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 many of the talks at this conference are, are about how to build a surrogate for your expensive computer simulation. So using as many runs as you can afford, you, instead of computing U, you approximate it with some kind of a U tilde, which mimics the input-output map, right? Given the same types of inputs, gives an approximate output to what you would get from the computer code. And then, uh, and then you run your same statistical procedure on that surrogate instead of the full code. And for example, what, what might you use for, for the U tilde? You might use polynomials. You might use splines, Krieging. Radial basis functions, neural networks, yes, and process models, reduced basis methods, reduced order models. Uh, last night, David and Chi Chi and I were up until 2 in the morning. I, I think we, we had maybe doubled this list, and I cut them down just in case anybody asked any questions about any, anything from this list. I wanted to only be able to <laughs> mention ones that I could say something about. So, but, but there are a whole host of these types of surrogate modeling approaches to approximate the same kind of input output map. Um, and each has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, 
In particular, if, if we're sticking with this black box kind of paradigm, then there are some surrogate functions, such as polynomials, uh, that might require special point sets to construct a surrogate. So if you're, if you're constructing a polynomial, a multivariate, even a univariate, you probably want to use something that looks similar to like a Chebyshev point set in order for your, for your polynomial interpolation to remain, remain stable. Uh, and then what happens if you're in this black box world and some of your points, uh, some of the parameter values that you choose don't result in converged output simulations? And then if you want to do something that's adaptive, then you might have to, to at will, go back to the code and ask for the code to recompute itself again and again if you want to adaptively compute some kind of a surrogate. So, uh, but what happens if that at will computation, if, at, if, if you can't call the code as frequently as you want because you're on a limited computational budget, you've been given so many CPU hours on the, on the supercomputer, you've run out of them, and you haven't completed your tensor product of Chebyshev points or something like this, then, uh, then, what, are you, then what are you gonna do? Um, so the perspective that, that we started thinking about this was, instead of thinking of things as a black box, what if we're just given the database of runs? What if, what you, what if the guy who is set at running the codes, the analyst maybe is, has a computational budget and he runs some set of runs and input values and stores them, some kind of a, a, a compute or a storage cluster, and can you run some statistical analyses on that database? Um, and that's, that's sort of the idea of simulation informatics. So now we're to informatics and simulations. See where I'm going with this? We just switched them around and created a keyword. Um, but what can we leverage from the informatics community, for example, companies like Google and Yahoo, who work with really large databases, right, day, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, what, what can we leverage from them in, in, uh, in working with these simulation outputs, which are growing also, uh, certainly not at the rate of internet data, but, uh, but large enough that we're in the Terra scale, you know, we're, we're regularly in the Terra scale for generating, like, uh, high fidelity simulation. And so what these guys have done, they've done a really good job at things like scalability and machine learning on, on really large data sets, data sets. But what do they not have? The thing that they don't have is, what we're wondering is, what can we leverage from the engineers, the physicists, and the mathematicians? What we know is that these data sets are generated from very specific models, right? These, if, if, this comprise, if a whole bunch of these runs comprise our database, we know exactly where they came from, mathematically and computationally. We just didn't have the time to, and, or, or the resources to, to run as many as we wanted. Um, but the ones that we do have, we know a lot about them, about where they came from. So we have physical insight, and we have, and the, the mathematicians can give us characteristics of those data, things like smoothness or monotonicity, things that are really important when you're building those surrogates and approximation. And I'm good. So I'm going to tag David. All right. Tag. Give you that. Thank you. And now David's going to talk about where this came from, from our experience with uh, Sandia. Okay, uh, so quick lesson with Paul. Um, where all this stuff come, comes from, uh, be careful who you have coffee with. Uh, so all of this, well, all of this got started years ago when we started talking about some matrix problems in grad school, but then when he was a, a postdoc at Sandia, not visiting Stanford, uh, for, so I, I was at Sandia Livermore, and he was at Sandia Albuquerque. Um, so he, he, he came up and visited for, for a while, and he sat down and had a coffee. Um, and he said, how do I compute really large SVDs? Um, and so that's sort of uh, what I'll talk about a little bit for the, the uh, uh, next book. That's sort of how I got uh, introduced to uh, some of this stuff and could introduce uh, Paul to some of the techniques coming out of machine learning and how to compute SVDs of enormous data sets. All right, so people like pictures. So what's the sort of picture that Paul, Paul and I came up with and he's already alluded to a little bit? Well, the picture is the following. You've got your supercomputer, which is now represented by a factory. The, this is to denote that it's something expensive. So you can only do, 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 do a couple of these and rather than the engineer sort of blasting away at the supercomputer now, what the engineer is go, go, going to do is run Paul's, so, so he's go, going, uh, she in this case, is going to use all of her time on the supercomputer and build a database of runs and then store these in some sort of data computing cluster. Uh, you can get data computing clusters with petabytes or almost petabytes of storage for not unreasonable amounts of money these these uh, days, allowing you to do analysis of incredibly large data sets in a full tol tol tolerant 
and reasonably scale scalable way. Um, and so uh, I was going to talk a little bit more about this, but I, uh, Paul took a little bit more time than I thought he might, which is good. Paul's a great speaker. Uh, but the idea is you, you have some input per parameters and you have your simulation output view, and we're just going to store these in the database. Now, how should you think of a database in this case? Well, when we're looking at these, the, the types of sim simulations that Paul and I have been looking at, where you have a PDE that has some sort of time and uh, history, we're just going to treat the entire simulation output as a vector, and your database is just going to be a big matrix. So every different run corresponds to a different column of your matrix. Uh, and then what we're going to do is build reduce order models from this. And so this is where uh, Paul's question about the SVD came up. So if I have a database that's on the order of 100 gigabytes to uh, 100 ter ter terabytes, I, if you want to build a reduced order model of this, you need to uh, do something like an SVD. So how do I do an SVD of this uh, in, in an enormous matrix? So here's just a quick representation of what you get out of a, uh, some sort of ROM sample. Um, I should say that this is actually what our code produces, but we had to tweak an error parameter to get these curves so nicely far, 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 far apart. So the answer that sort of came from the informatics community is we could do these on these things called MapReduce clusters that people have been looking at, or have been developing um, at Google and Yahoo, and they've been using them to analyze the data that comes out of these enormous web crawls that they uh, generate. Um, Paul, how much time do I have left? You took my phone. Uh, eight and a half minutes. Okay. Can you, can I yep. that? Thank you. It'll beep when I get done, so okay. you'll all know when I'm out of time. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give a couple minute introduction to map MapReduce and sort of describe how you might do sort of a very simple type of scientific uh, or a, a very simple type of simulation analysis with it. Uh, so the idea is when Google and Yahoo were building all of these data analysis things, they wanted to use the cheapest computers possible. Um, and the problem with using the cheapest computers possible is that they fail more often than you would like. And so they wanted uh, things that were uh, very fault t uh, tolerant. Um, but they also wanted to avoid overloading their network of constantly moving data around the uh, cluster. And so what they would do is they'd take an algorithm on a data set and figure out a way of doing as much computation as possible locally. Now, as, as, as matrix analysis, this is sort of a, a standard thing. We want to reuse data in cache as much as possible. So what they're doing is they're just, just taking that same idea and applying it to much more massive uh, 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 data sets. And so that's, that's sort of the key idea. What they're going to do is implement one type of communication, and they're going to implement one type of pair, pair, parallel communication in a fault tolerant way. What they're going to let you do is uh, you take a whole bunch of data sets that may be distributed throughout a cluster, and you can take these and transform them. When you transform them, you can tag each piece of information that comes out. So this is. Uh, Think of this as tagging it with a row or a column number if you're doing some, some, some type of matrix operation. What the communication step will do is it'll move everything with the same key or, or the same tag to the same processor. At that point, you can do some sort of reduce operation. So if you were interested in doing, say, a row sum, you would map every element in your matrix to its particular row, that's its tag, and then your reduce operation would take all of the data with that tag and just perform a local sum. So all of the communication just happens in the shuffle step where you map things from tags to uh, 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 reducers. The idea is that you'll actually do something a little bit more expensive than just sort of mapping things to uh, the tag and tag in the map step, and we'll describe how you can use this to do a QR factorization um, in, in a second. But the way, the way you get fault tolerance here is all, of the is all of the input is actually stored in triplicate around your cluster, and all of the intermediate outputs are written in triplicate. Uh, so you're, you would have to have three machines on your cluster fail in order to have your entire computation fail. Um, and it's it, three very particular machines. All right, so. Just, just, just another quick example, how might you do some type of analysis of a simulation output? So here we have three columns of our matrix. Each column has uh, three time steps of a simulation in this case. And what we want to do is figure out the variance of a, of, of, of a particular mesh point here. 
Well, so uh, suppose we just make the very uh, simplifying assumption for a picture that each of these runs is stored on si uh, inside of each machine. Then what each mapper is go going to do is tag or is output each mesh point um, with the with 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 some sort of tag on the, or that that identifies that uh, uh, mesh point. Those will all be sort of grouped by the same reducer. So what we can do is we want the variance, all the reducer has to do is compute a variance of all of the data it gets in, and then we can com com compute a variance overall. Now, so the message here is that we can bring the computations to out the data, but if you look at what's happening here, it sure looks like we're bringing all the data to the computation uh, because we're sort of aggregating it on the uh, reducer. So what I'm sort of tucking under the rug here for a, 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 a quick in, in, in introduction is that you, uh, for, for, for a lot of the things you're interested in computing, you can actually locally combine these. So what you could do is form a local variance and then output just that little bit of local variance to uh, the uh, reducer. So it would only have three little bits of data to input instead of nine in this case. All right, so I said that what we wanted to do was we wanted to compute an SVD. Uh, so the way we're going to compute an SVD is by first taking our matrix, which is incredibly tall, 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 and skinny. Um, this matrix has, say, between 100 and 1,000 columns, and it has a couple of million rows. And we're going to compute a QR factorization of this. Now, a QR factorization is one of the uh, really, or, or is an incredibly nice algorithm to implement in MapReduce, because all you have to do is if you think about um, taking your matrix and envisioning each row of that matrix, uh, sorry, uh, e uh, small blocks of that matrix are your original pieces of data. So your matrix is just distributed amongst a whole bunch of processors in different blocks. Well, each local computer is just going to read through all of its blocks and, out and do a single QR factorization of it. Um, so here I've actually shown a pipeline where you can do, do uh, this using what Jim Demel calls a serial streaming TSQR operation uh, where, where you only read in uh, a number of blocks until you hit the cache size of your processor and so you can do, do some optimizations at that level. But the idea here is what you're doing in the map phase of that operation was just taking your local data and outputting the R factor from a QR of all of the data you have locally. Um, it turns out that the key that you output this with doesn't matter for the QR operation. So in our code, we actually uh, just make a random number uh, at that point. Uh, so if we have a matrix A1 through A8, we output two matrices R. So if you envision that these are incredibly tall, tall and skinny, so these, these each might have a million by, say, a thousand rows, this matrix R that comes out is only a thousand by a thousand. So it's a much more compact representation of that data. So the, so the final, uh, we do need to reduce down to one computer at the end. So this one computer gets those 2,000 by 1,000 matrices um, and computes an R of it. Um, so you can use this, uh, this, this uh, MapReduce idea to compute a QR factorization, at least if you're interested in getting just the R factor. So this will produce just the R. Uh, you can get Q via uh, uh, sort of a... Uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll say we're working on better ideas to get Q, but a very trivial idea to get Q is you can just multiply by the pseudo-inverse of R, uh, and you'll get something that's not perfectly orthogonal, but um, you can get it a little bit better with a, a step or two of iterative refinement. How do you go from QR to, to uh, the SVD? Well, here we're just using what's known as the RSVD algorithm, where you compute QR. R is now a thousand by a thousand matrix. You put that on one processor and just do an SVD of that uh, single matrix. Um, and then you can get your Q factor. Uh, so your Q of the SVD is just the product of those, those, those uh, two. Uh, so we actually tried uh, this. So, so using a uh, reduced order model that Paul is going to talk about on uh, Wednesday morning. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to know more about uh, the particular reduced order model we're looking at, go see Paul's talk on Wednesday morning. Uh, we use this to study a uh, nonlinear time-dependent heat transfer problem at Sandia. Uh, it's it's big, um, <laughs> and so uh, what we get out of this uh, is sort of a full model that looks like this, and a reduced model that looks like this, and some sort of variance uh, that grows. So the scales here; these are about a thousand, and the variance is about four, uh, forty-two. So 
somewhat mild variance compared to uh, the sort of data, the full, full uh, model. If we look at how much faster we can go here, we're about 500 times faster. Okay, uh, I think I have, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm on a few announcements. So the few announcements are really introductions to uh, the uh, remaining talks. Um, Okay, Paul was supposed to remember how to pronounce it the same, so I'm going to call Paul on this one. Uh, uh, Barnabas Potsosh. Pot okay, yeah. oh, All right, close. so he per per perfected this one. Uh, so he's going to tell tell us about how to do machine learning on vector data. Uh, Chi Chi Wang is going to tell us a little bit about how to do sensitivity analysis and, and some sort of uh, experimental design uh, on unsteady problems. Is that still what you're talking about, Chi Chi? Yeah. All right, uh, and then uh, Chandrika. Come on, uh, oh, man, I forgot. Paul? Come on. Come on. Come on. Uh, the harder you try, the harder it is. I know, she mentioned this beforehand. Uh, is is going to tell tell us a little bit more about what's what's already known in this perspective. She's been doing a lot of work on this for quite some time. Uh, so I want to mention two things. We're trying to record video, so check uh, with us on video, and then come back at 6.30 for a quick retrospective. Um, we also have a blog if you're interested in these uh, topics, so if you can't make it to uh, the rest of our talks, come see our blog where we'll post all the links to uh, the videos. Um, there's actually a ton of other stuff uh, going on at this meeting that ties in with this idea we've ta uh, talked about. So actually a lot of it was today, but there's a great invited uh, talk tomorrow. There's a couple of mini symposiums, so MS27. Um, the mini tutorial five, and then there's a couple of talks on Thursday, and there's Paul's talk on Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to skip that, which was just a, a, a quick discussion for people in the Bay Area. We, we, we've got a, tut or a, a upcoming workshop on MapReduce. Um, so if you're interested, uh, mention it to Paul, Paul, or I. But in closing, just a couple of quick comments, or one quick comment. If you look at the Wikipedia page on machine learning, there's a quote that says there are many similarities between machine learning theory and statistics, although they use different terms. We think that uh, there are many sim similarities between uncertainty quantification and machine learning theory, although they also use, use uh, different terms. So they also study slightly different problems, but we think there's a lot of useful information to be gathered from looking at things from multiple perspectives. So thank you, and I apologize for going two minutes over time. <laughs> just needs, uh, it's, it's, well, it, it's at least one, but it's usually not too much more than one. Uh, so, uh, no is the answer there. And that. Yeah, because that's Either one. Oh, I mean the step up. Well, I guess I would say it's a challenge to develop new algorithms that obey the restriction. Yeah, I agree. My question relates to that, I guess, you know, at National Labs is, industry, we're generating these huge volumes of simulation data, which is very structured and has a lot of correlations. Do you, a lot of our customers are asking, well, do you do things like anomaly detection, feature detection, or you know, we you know, just intuit something out of my masses of data, not yeah, the quantity that's well described as variance. Do you have a sense of how well those kind of algorithms map? I might just talk a little bit about how well they map on the map yeah. So th 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 there's a ton of work by the machine learning community community on, exa on exactly those types of problems. So, again, it depends on what you mean by an anomaly, but they have looked at this for all sorts of their different ways of looking at anomalies. It would be interesting to chat with you about what your way is and how it might map on the problems that they're looking at. Just on that subject, uh, I agree. Uh, I'm not convinced, I guess, that that reduces necessarily the way to go. I mean, I do NPI. Uh, you know, I've written programs that work very similar to that, I guess, other than this whole tolerance, which is definitely a big thing as you go towards excess scale, what other, what are you buying with MapReduce compared to just an MPI implementation? Because I, I mean, I can imagine, I have a, a data set that, as you mentioned, is very well structured, very well understood, it's organized almost essentially exactly how you mentioned in yours ones for big turbulence data sets. Uh, so, unfortunately, that would require about another entire talk, and I, if, if you're in the Bay Area for our tutorial, I'd recommend you come there, because we'll talk a lot about, uh, about that. Um, but in some sense, it comes down to a matter of programming in the sense that it's very easy to teach someone how to get sort of at the map reduce way of looking at a problem. Um, and then, I, I had a slide on this, but you can put up our entire entire implementation on one page uh, that's a fault tall, tall, tolerant and scale, scalable implementation. So it's got some advantages in terms of that. In terms of speed, it, it, is, a bit of, it is at a bit of a deficiency. 
uh, deficiency NPI. But but I, I think it's a really good question, and uh, and also I think um, you know part, part of what we'll be doing in future work is is checking those, making those comparisons. Yeah. So I think we should move yeah. on. But uh, if you have other questions, we'll be here at six thirty, and we're going to go out to our dinner. So if people want to keep talking about this stuff, please come along to our dinner. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a speaker? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So, so next, next is Barnabas. I, I, I meant to say that, and Chichi's going to be third. Oh, okay. Yeah.